We got gotcha. you. Okay, I think everybody else, all the other board members, their video and audio are working. Sarah, did we check your audio yet? Can you okay. hear me all right? There we go. I, I heard Sarah and Aaron. There's Karina. <clears throat> And is Jan planning on being here? I hadn't heard that oh, she was. Oh, there she is. I saw her. Okay. There she is. Okay. So, Karina, could you do a video sound check? Or Jan McGinnis, can you? Oh, there you go, Karina. I can't hear you, Karina. Can't hear me. Oh, there you go. I can hear you now. Mm -hmm. It's a bad Verizon commercial. How about you, Jan? Right here. Yep, we can hear can you. you hear me? Yep. All right, I'm going to mute it. Okay, Ms. President, I think we've got everybody in and video and audio. So now I will share my screen. Make sure, nope, not that one. Okay. We're good to go when you are, B. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order then. Welcome to everyone who is with us. It's good to see all of you well. And welcome to those who are watching us on Zoom or live on YouTube. And uh, we're recording the meeting so that it can be played at a, again at a later time. So welcome to those individuals who will be watching then. Um, during public comment, um, you will need to log in to the meeting to speak. Did you receive any requests, Paulette? I did not. Uh, please read with me the mission statement for the Marshalltown School District. We develop learners who have the knowledge, skills, and positive mindset to successfully pursue a meaningful future through personalized learning experiences. And stand as you're able and join me in the pledge. Okay. I pledge allegiance. Give me the flag. Of the United, United States, States of, of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. For all. There it is. And for those of you who have already I just went away, but now I'm back. Okay. Uh, do you have any, Theron? Yeah, we have one uh, change to the agenda in the consent agenda. We have an addition for a open enrollment request for Sierra and Sophia Geary.
Were you able to hear? Is anybody else having dimmed or standing or is it just me? I was able to hear you. I am I, not able to hear you, B. I think it's just me. I think it's just B. B, maybe you can hop back out and then hop back in and see if that'll help. Say, uh, Amy, did you also try and share your screen? Because uh, if you did, I'm not seeing anything. Is anybody else seeing my screen? I over to Sean. I can see your screen, Amy. Okay, thank you. It might be the view that you're viewing, but I it looks right on the YouTube channel. It says the, the internet connection is unstable. I can see mine. I did have to drag it to make it big enough to read and make all of you smaller. <laughs> There's a little place you can grab it and pull, and that's what I did. The, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I wonder if, if other people are, if you need to call in tonight. Just recommendation. Um, yeah, it, I'm sure it would be more difficult for you to call in, but it might make things so smoother unless you want to call in and then restart your I computer. I can call in, but let's have take over the meeting. Okay. I think Dr. Schutte, were, did, had B asked if there were any changes to the uh, agenda? Is that where we were? Yes, and okay. there was one one change uh, we added to the consent agenda, one open enrollment request for Sierra and Sophia Gary. Okay, then is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Second. I had a motion by Unteed and a second by, was that you, Jan? Yes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, Adam. Do we have, we have some recognitions tonight? We do indeed. Um, so we have with us uh, three students, uh, Jason Strand, Avery Bolar, and, uh, and Claudia Hernandez, who I hope I said every student's name correctly. They are all state qualifiers for National History Day. And they had all of their uh, projects and press judges. Um, this has all been virtual, of course, all of the judging and, and sharing of the projects um, as we are all getting used to. Uh, and so I see from our attendees list, I, I saw for sure a few of the students and Susan Fr uh, Fritzel uh, from Marshalltown High School. She, I'm gonna pass it to her. She uh, is helping oversee um, the Students National History Day projects. And so she is gonna share a little bit about National History Day and then we'll pass it off to uh, Claudia, Jason and Avery to talk a little bit about uh, their projects. So with that, Amy, if uh, I see that Susan is indeed on as an attendee, if you could switch her to um, being able to speak and then we'll, we're, we'll hear from her. She is on and able to speak. I will unmute her. So Susan, can you talk? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, thanks. Um, this is Susan. I'm the high school extended learning program teacher. And before we talk about these three special students, I just wanted to point out that uh, between Miller, Lenahan, and the high school, we had a lot of students start um, History Day this fall. 
um, the theme this year was breaking barriers in history. And Lenahan was planning to send five exhibit boards to the district contest and Miller had a paper and a website in the performance. And we at um, the high school had a paper performance and exhibit to enter. Uh, then we went into spring break, COVID-19 hit, we didn't come back. Um, the contest was supposed to be two weeks later at Central College on March 25th. And obviously um, we hit barriers. The, uh, the contest went virtual. It was hard for all the kids to get together, especially groups, groups of students. Um, so a lot of our students were not able to enter the contest. However, we did get three Marshalltown groups um, entered. And I am pleased to say that two of them, like you heard, did qualify for the state contest. And that's Claudia Hernandez's paper on Sorwana de la Cruz and Jason Strand and Avery Bowler's performance on Alice Paul. Um, so I'll let them talk now if you can um, find them. And uh, the state contest is May 4th. So they're working on improvements to get there and enter again. I have AVR, but what was the other student's name? Jason Strand is her partner for performances. Thanks. And Claudia Hernandez was our paper writer. I see <laughs> Claudia in there. Um, Susan, Susan, do you know if uh, Jason is calling in? I, see I have no idea. I haven't heard from him today. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's let Claudia talk about her essay, and then I know uh, it sounds like Avery and Jason partnered on their project. Correct. And if Jason's able to, we'd love to have him speak. Uh, but Avery, I'm sure would would be able to describe the project, obviously as well. So. Uh, Okay, Jason is on under his mom's name, it looks like. And what's her name? Under Francis. Okay. Strand. Francis Strand. There we go. All right, I think I have everybody promoted. Hey, Claudia, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, uh, well, I'm Claudia Hernandez. Um, I did my paper over Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, and she was a poet and writer in 17th century colonial Mexico. Um, a lot of her writings advocated for women's rights in a time that um, weren't really allowed. And she was kind of considered one of the first feminists during her time. And she was really a adv advocate for breaking barriers for women in colonial Mexico. Thank you, Claudia. And now Jason or Avery. Oh my God. Avery, you're muted. Okay, so. Alice was a suffragist in America that used radical tactics that she learned in England when she went to college, such as hunger strikes, picketing, and holding parades to help ratify the 19th Amendment. Okay. Another reason why we chose Alice, because this year, 2020, we celebrate 100 years of women being able to be politically involved. Jason and I present our project through a performance. There are many other ways to present, which he mentioned earlier, and last year we made it to state finals and this year we're hoping to make it to nationals. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> so um, that is our topic, Alice Paul, brave American suffragist. And fingers crossed we'll make it on to nationals this year. Any questions from anyone on these? Um, by the way, the performance has to be videotaped and we're submitting the videotape. Any questions? Uh, when is nationals? Um, it's usually in June and I'm guessing it's gonna be pushed back 
two weeks like all the other competitions because state's usually like the last week of April, but now it's like the first and second week of May. So it'll probably be in the middle to end of June. And it's virtual this year. National generally takes place in Maryland, but this year, since it's virtual, we won't go anywhere, but it'll still be exciting to make it. So. Any other questions from anybody? Well, thank you guys. Good luck and congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, good luck. Hi, right, thank you. And we do have B back. B, do you want to see if things improved? Let's have Sean continue and we'll see how long this lasts. Okay. <laughs> I would have gladly ceded control back to you, B. Oh, you're obviously doing fine because you're not in the same place on the agenda when everything went black in my world. So <laughs> keep going. Okay. So uh, moving on to the consent agenda, we've got uh, minutes from our April 6th regular board meeting. Any changes or corrections on that? Um, uh, anything in personnel, Dr. Schutte, Dr. Ryan? Yes, I just want to bring your attention to the retirement of Janet Shepard. She is retiring after almost 29 years here. Uh, she started her career as a para and then she ended it as our um, front desk or our district's receptionist here at central office. Uh, her commitment to children and the staff of our district will always be remembered and speaking personally, I really appreciated how she welcomed me to the district uh, with open arms and I'll forever be envious as I wrote there of her ability to remember faces and names. She was very gifted in that department. Um, she will be missed and we're very grateful for all of her years of service, almost 29 years. Yeah, and also within the personal items, we've got a recommendation uh, for hire for co-principals at Miller Middle School. We've got Mrs. Kristen Kell, who uh, has a BA in history and secondary ed from Loris College in Dubuque, an MA in curriculum instruction with emphasis in teaching English as a second language from Buena Vista and a uh, degree in educational administration from Iowa from the Iowa State University. Uh, she's served as a teacher and teacher leader for Marshalltown before having served the last five years as a BCLUW high school principal. So we welcome Kristen back to Marshalltown. And then Mr. Dave Glenn, who received a BA in science from the University of Iowa, an MA in educational administration from the Iowa State University. Uh, he has served as a teacher, teacher leader, and assistant principal in Colonesco and Ankeny before having served the past four years as the assistant principal at Miller Middle School. Uh, this new co-principal configuration um, is able to happen as a result of our current middle school principal, Mr. Pat Ryle, transferring to the high school to assume Justin Balber's position as assistant principal. Justin leaves us to become the new lead principal at Roland Story. So we're super excited about this transition for both the high school and middle school. And Kristen and Dave have been invited to join us to say a few words as well. Dave, are you able to speak yet? Yes, <clears throat> I am here. So <laughs> it kicked me off right for a second, so I wasn't quite sure what had happened. Um, 
Yeah, I just uh, want to echo what Dr. Schutte said about my level of excitement of being able to to uh, embark on this journey with Kristen. Um, in the short opportunity as I've had to visit with her, I think we're going to make a great team. And I think uh, I'm really excited for the way uh, things are shaping up for Miller and, and uh, the prospects for, for some really special things happening there. So thank you for the opportunity. And Kristen was concerned with uh, issues they had with Zoom, but Kristen, are you there? I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, I echo what Dave said. We've only just met a few times, but I'm really excited to continue the good things that are going on at Miller. And I'm excited for Dave and I to take it to the next level and kind of venture on this co-principal's journey with him. We've kind of both been in different realms from small schools to big schools. Um, I'm really excited to be back in Marshalltown. It's, it will be nice to be back home. And um, I thank Theron and the school board for this opportunity and, and taking a chance on me. And um, I like how um, Theron, you emphasize the Iowa State, but you didn't emphasize the uh, University of Iowa when you were in, uh, introducing Dave. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but again, I am so uh, excited for this opportunity and excited to be at Miller and uh, to be part of um, the Bobcat family. There's a university in Iowa City, Kristen? Yes, yes, there is, Mr. Miller. I didn't know. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think you have a child there, actually. Mike. Oh, oh. Not right now, I don't. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Both of you. Thanks, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, interagency agreements. We've got an agreement with Executive Speakers Bureau for uh, a couple of, I think those are virtual, aren't they, Dr. Schutte? Correct. Those two virtual presentations for uh, school district staff, April 23rd and May 14th, uh, an agreement with YSS uh, to provide student services to districts, to students on district property. Um, uh, one student uh, to Iowa City and one to Sioux City. Any questions about any of those things? Do we have, do we evaluate uh, speakers like this? Um, traditionally, like when it's embedded within our uh, professional development, we do um, with our staff. Th this will be a little bit unique being outside of ours, but we certainly can do the same thing here. So the answer to that is yes, it's usually embedded within all of our professional development. Oh, it's in my thing. So open enrollments, uh, one in and two out. Paulette, is there anything of note in, in bills or in the monthly financials? No, there's not. Uh, in gifts, grants, and bequests, we've got uh, the STEM scale-up award for differentiated math center units for K-4 schools in Lenahan, and the STEM scale-up program grant for Project Lead the Way Cybersecurity at Marshalltown High School. We've got the 2021 go Marshalltown okay. Learning Academy Handbook. Um, that's what we saw last week. Uh, no changes from, from what was presented last week. Were there, Dr. Shooty? There were not. And then we've got a couple more. Um, graduates from the Marstown Learning Academy. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move for approval. Seconded. 
Uh, I've got a I've got Miller with a motion and McGinnis with a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Say no. Motion carries seven zero. Is there any public comment? I think Paulette, you said no one had emailed in with anything. Correct. I received no written email comments. Okay. Then we'll move on to uh, the education portion of the agenda. Uh, we've got the COVID-19 continuous learning services update from Dr. Schutte, Dr. Stevenson, Lynn Large, and Amy Harmson. Yeah, so I had asked uh, members of our administrative team to give some updates in their respective uh, arenas uh, as of late. As everybody knows, the governor announced on Friday closure for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year, which I don't think came as a surprise to too many people. I think it's important to um, remember that our board had previously approved in order to um, mitigate any additional anxiety or concern amongst our employees that our intention was and is, still is to pay all employees through the end of their contract or the regular uh, school year for this year. And we've been working hard to try to find uh, substantive ways to keep uh, those employees uh, engaged in working, particularly our classified through professional development and other ways that make sense um, as we continue down this journey. Also uh, with the governor's announcement was an announcement on the cancellation of uh, spring athletic activities, which I know was extraordinarily disappointing for a number of our student athletes and coaches as well, but is understood under the current circumstances as Marshtown particularly continues to move uh, towards a peak with this virus and, and the virus uh, spreading. Uh, there was also uh, uh, an announcement from the governor about a waiver uh, for the calendar start date for next year. So we will continue to evaluate whether um, putting forward an alternative start date in the future um, is, is something that we want to do or not um, moving forward. The, um, there's a lot of obviously activities that are being impacted, whether that means cancellation this spring or possible postponement. Um, so a lot of those things are high school related. So I know Mrs. Wyant's going to specifically, uh, hopefully uh, communicate to our parents and our students what the plan is going forward as far as high school grades and credits uh, for this year. And, and there's gonna still be some unanswered questions as to um, what may or may not happen moving forward in terms of typical end of the year activities. Um, uh, I would say first and foremost, uh, graduation uh, being one of them. But again, uh, I want to thank B for sending a very complimentary uh, email out to our district level administrative team. Um, I th without any question, I think everybody on the team is working 24 seven, working harder than they probably ever have worked in their career in terms of trying to stay on top of not only what we need to do for the present time, but planning ahead, whether it be for things like, can we make summer school happen? Um, what's next year look like if we can start on time or if we start earlier? Uh, what if we're not fully able to open at the beginning of next year? There's a lot of unknowns and question marks yet that if not consuming people's physical time, it's certainly consuming their mental time as we try to figure out how to be proactive and improve things going forward. So I want to commend both the, all the staff really um, that we have all the 900 plus employees for their role in doing everything possible to make this transition to virtual learning or packet learning and 
uh, feeding people, uh, providing access to technology. I mean, there's a lot of different moving parts, communicating effectively with people uh, on Adam's behalf. Uh, just a lot of people have really risen to the occasion to try to help uh, with these very challenging and stressful times for everyone involved. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Stevenson. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have a few things to share with you regarding uh, what's been happening um, during closure from the curriculum instruction and assessment department. Um, we launched our Learn From Home website um, last Sunday, a week ago Sunday, and that website should serve as a one-stop shop for all of our PK-12 families. Um, it's a great effort, a great collaborative effort that was created Dave Stanfield is the designer of the website and he worked collaboratively with me and um, our CPDLs, curriculum professional development leaders, uh, preschool director, English language learner director um, to make sure that every one of our 400 plus teachers has a spot on that site. So um, what you'll see is weekly teachers are meeting in teams on Mondays and Tuesdays, grade level teams, department teams, um, to think about their lessons they want to plan for the week. Um, and then they break off on Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera, to um, thanks for who's ever pulling this up. There's a few different ways you can get to the website. Um, but there are um, lessons being created as we speak during the week by PLCs. Um, we have elementary schools working together in partners. Um, they're designing um, digital-based lessons for the Learn From Home website. Uh, with the goal that everything is completed by the end of the day, Thursday. Um, so we followed some recommendations from the Department of Education about how many minutes a day of learning is appropriate during this time of crisis. Um, so every grade level has a little bit different look in terms of minutes of instruction. Um, as always, we're encouraging people to use digital curriculum that we've had in place that kids are very familiar with, including STMath and Lexia. And um, on Thursday, a lot of magic occurs. Those teacher lessons that were created and made all get taken over into certain Google folders and Google Drive and cleaned up um, so that on Friday, um, the paper packet party can begin. We have a para educator or secretaries or combination thereof at all of our school sites, as well as um, Mickey England here at Central Office and Maria Ramirez working um, in conjunction with Rex and his team to create paper packets for all of our students who either don't have internet access or have adults helping them at home who prefer helping them with paper instead of um, technology. So um, we passed out paper packets last week on Tuesday and saw the biggest jump in lunches served that day. So I think the kids were excited to come get their materials. And then this week we started distributing them on Monday, which is our plan is that the new content goes live on Sunday, so families that do work can have a look at it and plan out their week for kids. Um, with that being said, um, just so you can kind of picture what's happening, Rex has six buses that leave the bus barn every morning around 11 or so to go out on their routes around town to deliver lunches and, and other things. And we have a Rover car that's following those buses. And in the car, there's a box with, um, with these folders, um, envelopes, I should say, that have packets created in them. So we're working to reduce our paper waste. We know the first week we made too much of things we didn't need, and um, we can kind of predict how many kids are gonna show up at each of the bus stops, as well as how many of the kids are showing up at each of the nine schools that are serving lunch. Um, so we're working on reducing that. And then the second feedback we got was that the paper packets were not so great. Um, for people who don't have internet, which of course we took that into consideration and attempted this week in week two to have lessons that were more um, unplugged, things you can do with your kids without a device. So that was something that's been going on in that area. Um, as a point of reference um, on the buses, week one, we passed out 518 packets last Tuesday. Today, I'm hearing on the buses that we passed out 275 packets. So I'm not exactly sure um, why the great decrease. My guess is um, people are 
figuring out ways to either get access to Wi-Fi or um, maybe they're thinking that the bus will be back tomorrow. I don't know, because we had some pretty nice weather today. Um, the schools, uh, I don't have the week one total for the schools, but um, today the schools passed out 149 packets. So without um, the high school numbers included in here, we passed out packets today to 424 children um, between the ages of pre-K and 12, pre-K through 12. So we'll keep doing that work because we know um, that that's important to keep kids in a routine of learning. And for many, um, those first couple weeks that we had sent home material with the kids, um, it was kind of game-based and keeping them busy, thinking that we'd be coming back to school. And then in phase two, when we had that longer stretch of time, um, what teachers did when they planned those lessons was think about previously learned material as sort of a review for students. And now moving forward, starting Monday the 27th, those lessons online and in paper will include new content and new standards. And so. I'll be working with the principals tomorrow morning to talk through what that looks like. Um, and then we'll be sharing that with teacher teams for next week. Um, the last thing that I wanted to share with you um, in terms of thinking about, or well, second to last thing, I'm sorry, about learning from home is that we use a system called Clever. And Clever is like a one um, way um, to get into your computer without having our kids to get into Chromebooks without having to remember a whole bunch of passwords. And so, I asked um, Dave Stanfield for some analytics from our Clever data because um, our Google website, we don't have that quite yet. Um, and as of the last week, we had 2,920 students who did log into their Chromebook and use Clever. Um, and that equates to 29.4% of our students. So we're really, really hoping that as time goes on, you know, the repeated messaging is hitting the right ears and that parents are um, listening to, for example, what the governor said Friday, that even though this is considered voluntary, it's critical to get this practice and keep learning um, because 30% is not where we wanna be. Um, and then some of you have heard me talk quite a bit about things like Lexia and ST Math. Those are things our kids are very familiar with. Um, so in terms of Lexia, which is used, um, in our P, I'm sorry, our K-5 classrooms, we've had 5,500 students log in just in the last seven days. 5,500 logins um, for Clever, through Clever to Lexia. And then Power Up is what our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders use. It's the secondary version of that. We've had 1,400 students log in, student log ins during the last seven days. Um, and ST Math, which is I'm um, happy to report is in year three and still moving along in a great way. Um, we've had 7,300 logins, student logins in the last week. So that's great. I, we're really excited that our kids are comfortable using that kind of game-based learning that we have with ST Math and Lexia. And now we hope that that learning carries over into our learn from home website. And lastly, I wanted to share, some people are wondering what teachers are up to during closure in addition to planning lessons and hosting daily um, office hours and attending meetings, um, they've been doing some professional learning. So during that phase one closure, which was the first couple weeks, first two to three weeks, I say, um, we had our teachers participate in Google certification and that um, ended on April 7th. And then in, we're currently in phase two of professional learning for our teachers. And they are taking a three-week course called Culturally Creating Culturally Responsive Classrooms, um, which is taught through a company called Support Ed. Um, and they're in building-based groups learning this content together for three weeks. It's a 15-hour course. And then we're currently working with the AEA so that when that ends on April 30th, um, we can talk about moving um, from May 1st to June 5th into some online learning through the AEA that will help teachers become more comfortable with teaching online as well as other topics that they can choose from. Are there questions for either Dr. Schutte or Dr. Stevenson before we move on to, to Amy or Lynn? I don't have a question, but I have received some compliments from parents on the website for distance learning. They find it easy to work with and they're pleased with it. Thank you. 
I want to say the same thing. Um, as a parent, I was able to. So it, it is very user friendly. So they did an amazing job. Could we get B back in as a panelist? B is in as a panelist, and I think she's joining audio by phone. So I had allowed her to talk. Um, and then I just muted it because she was in and out a little bit. So. Um, okay. Uh, I just saw she was in the, in the chat box, and I just want to make sure that you saw her. Yes, she okay. is now back in. Lisa, did you say power up is six, seven, and eight, or just seven and eight? Power up? Yes. Um, that's six, seventh, and eighth. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I will jump in now um, to kind of piggyback on some things that Lisa said. Um, my main part in this is to try to ensure these kids have access to technology. So my team has been working really diligently to get some things in place to ensure we can get these Chromebooks out to kids. Um, and then we've been working with principals and then their buildings to contact these families now that we kind of had the original original push to get Chromebooks out. Now we're actually contacting families. We um, did a Facebook and Infinite Campus survey to see who has internet. And we got about a 60% um, response to that. And then we actually went back and asked principals to have paras and teachers actually call, email, do anything they can to reach the rest of families. So currently we're sitting at about an 85% um, response rate for who has internet in our district. Um, we see that out of the people who have responded, we have 73% of students who have internet and 11% of students who don't. Obviously we still have some work to do. Um, we're trying to still contact the rest of the 15% of the families who didn't respond. And we are working in conjunction with JBS currently. I sent them the list of the actual names of people so that they could tell us um, and help us get the responses for the folks that worked for them if they didn't respond. So they're still helping us. And then we'll do a final phone call push, especially for the high school, as we work to get those kids who are dual enrolled access to the internet. So it's really important for us to know who has internet and who doesn't. And then for us to continue to investigate how we might help those people who don't have access. Finally, I wanted to share our Chromebook checkout results. Um, so far to date, we've checked out 1,891 Chromebooks to pre-K through six grades. Um, the 7th through 12th already had um, Chromebooks. So we have a percentage of about 70% of Chromebooks that have been checked out to elementary kids and about 70 to 73% Chromebooks that have been checked out to Lenahan. And what I what I mean by percent is the percentage of the fleet that we had available um, is checked out. So we can say that probably 72% of kids in Lenahan have their Chromebook. So that's where we're currently sitting and we are still continuing to do the work to get people more access that they need. Questions for Amy? So for, um, I guess my question would be, you know, we're trying to get um, to see if kids are, have or don't have internet. Is that just for the purpose of being able to track the kids that are on Lexia? Cause we can do that, right? Or I mean, are we trying to get them internet? I mean, what? <laughs> um, 
there has been no decision decision um, on whether or not we would actually try to get all of these kids internet, but we have already ordered 150 hotspots. And we know that we wanna at least try the seniors who are dual enrolled, who don't have internet. We wanna try to get them internet in some way so that they can get those credits easier um, by being able to have the access that they need for at least the ones who are actually dual enrolled, taking MCC courses and they can get those credits. So that is, there's kind of um, a priority on the kids that would be dual enrolled. Um, and then we just continue to investigate um, internet options um, as they come up, because as we see money is being available to us um, for that sort of initiative, then we can act quickly and know who doesn't have access. So right now it's just investigation, but hopefully it'll allow us to act on it quickly if that if the ability comes up. Thanks. Any other questions for Amy? Have you been able to reach all of the high school students that are dual enrolled? Because that would seem to be a priority. No, we have not, but that's not for lack of trying. We have, um, we definitely have an emphasis of priority on the high school. And that's why we're doing things like even reaching out to JBS, trying to figure out different avenues of reaching those kiddos because we have called them. We've, we've done everything but carrier pigeon to try to get a hold of those kids. So um, yes, we're continuing to do everything we can and we do have an emphasis on, on those kids specifically. Yeah, and it seems to me that if they're dual enrolled in college classes, those students should be reaching out to you as well. They are to being released as adults into our society. Mm -hmm. They could make some effort. Okay. Lynn, I'm, I'm ready for you if you, Thanks, Amy. you're ready to go. Yep. Okay, great. Um, it's hard to believe that we're already through our fifth week of the Meals Close to Home program. Um, since we started the program, um, coming back in March, the week of March 16th, we've seen the participation in our meals double, um, more than double actually. And um, on average, we're serving just close to 1400 kids a day. So compared to a normal school day, that's about 35% roughly of the normal meals we would serve on any given day at school. So I feel really good about the success of this program and that we're reaching the kids in Marshalltown that truly have a need. Um, and, you know, I have to give a huge shout out to Rex and the whole transportation department because the mobile bus routes have made this program flourish. Um, we're actually seeing more meals distributed on the bus, the, the six bus routes than at the 10 building sites. So that's really positive. Um, on any given day, it's about 900 meals going off those bus routes and then about 500 meals out of the school building. So that's pretty fun to see the kids coming out to the bus to get a meal to take home. Um, we are offering breakfast and lunch each day in a bag. They, they grab it, they take it home to eat it. Um, and then on Fridays, um, students can also take a breakfast and a lunch for both Saturday and Sunday if they desire to have it. So we really hope that we're filling that need for these families and bridging the gap to help them get through this tough time. Um, and then of course, you know, the collaboration between the transportation department, and the food service department has been wonderful. And I also just can't say enough positive things about the food service staff and supervisors. They've been really excited um, just to try new things and to do whatever it takes to get these meals into the hands of the kids. And that's the most important thing right now. And we're just having a lot of fun trying some new methods of feeding. Any questions for Lynn? You got off easy, Lynn. Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, moving on to the Marshalltown High School grading options. Is Jackie, Mrs. Wyant? In? I'm here. Hello, Mrs. Wyant. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be here and talk about these options. We have a lot of people concerned and interested in what's going on at the high school. I think Amy has some slides. So uh, we have a letter that was translated today into Spanish after some, um, some changes to match a video presentation. And so um, Amy, why don't we go ahead and start with the, with the slides? Thank you. So students will have some options available to them and there's a video that's been created and will be posted immediately following the board meeting tonight. So the purpose of the presentation is to explain to the students the three options that are available to them um, and, and something that they will have to think carefully with their parents and with their school counselors as they make some decisions about their courses and the work that they've done either during the first uh, six weeks of the semester for non-dual credit classes and for the remainder of the semester for our students enrolled in those concurrent classes. And so I just provided some contact information and we'll go ahead and skip a couple slides here, Amy. So the first option that students will have is the opportunity to take the grade that's currently represented in Infinite Campus. And for some students, um, they had completed all of their work before they went on spring break. And so they may be pleased what's currently represented there. Some students may not have, or some students didn't have the opportunity to work with the student or the teacher to relearn some things and redo some assessments, which we would normally do during our, what is called ENR or, I'm, or our multi-tiered support system. So we have that every single day and teachers pull in students and they reteach things to them. So um, students will have some time where they can work with their classroom teachers and get the work that um, occurred between uh, January 21st and March 6th and get those grades up to snuff if they like. So um, of course we want students to have a passing grade so that they can go into the next course even though we know that there's a little bit of learning that's been shortened um, in this time. Next slide please Amy. It's important for students to understand also, this is really, really important for them to understand that we will continue uh, when we place a letter grade on the transcript, it does impact their GPA and um, the letter grade will continue to, if it's passing to provide a high school credit for this semester. So they're not being shortened um, in any way whatsoever. They will have a little bit of time and they will have all the way to May 28th to work on that, um, the work that they have that's missing. And again, they should discuss with their parents and guardians and the school counselor how taking the letter grade is going to impact their GPA. The second option is to take pass and no pass. Pass and no pass at the high school does not impact the GPA. It does grant the credit if you earn a P for passing. Um, again, the P will be determined based on the percentage that's represented in Infinite Campus and students should continue to work with their teachers to complete any work, to do retakes and any redos. Um, they also have till May 28th to make that decision. And so just to clarify in our course guide, 59.5% is passing grade and anything less than that is not a passing grade. Um, getting a passing grade will allow a student to continue onto the next course in the sequence of a course path, pathway. Um, however, a no pass and also a failure may impact um, whether or not a student can go on in the course pathway. And so we really want students to work with their counselors, go ahead, Amy, um, and their parents to understand that. So again, the P does not impact the GPA. It does give a credit, the NP not pass will not calculate into the GPA and it will not give credit. Again, can't say it enough times, students need to work with their counselor and their parents when they make these decisions. Finally, dropping the course is the third option. And um, this has to be done in consultation with the school counselor because uh, one of the things is um, to, if the students enrolled at the high school, they need to have some courses on 
um, their schedule. They can't just drop everything. Uh, there's some courses that are required and part of the graduation requirement. And even if they don't pass them, um, there should be some representation that they were a student at Marshalltown High School. So that, that impacts students in grades nine through 11. Obviously in students in grades 12, we don't want them to drop classes that are required for graduation. The drop deadline for um, classes is May 1st. So the students will need to work with their school counselor in making that decision and their parents. As I previously mentioned, any student that fails or gets an NP will not get credit for the course. And sometimes this impacts their ability to move on to a sequential course in a pathway, or they may have to uh, retake that class because it fulfills graduation requirements. And I, I also want students to think about their academic eligibility as they make these decisions. Um, we do have guidelines that are provided by both athletic associations in the state of Iowa on the guidance for students' participation in athletics, which includes passing four classes in the semester enrolled. And if they have any failures in that prior semester, they're ineligible for 30 days in any athletic contest in that next event that, or uh, program that they enroll. Um, so there was some, a little bit of conversation about concurrent enrollment. And just to be clear, um, almost all of them are involved with the teacher and communicating with the teacher. We do have a couple of students that we're tracking down because um, the teacher hasn't been able to contact them over the last couple of weeks. So uh, I personally ran notes over to a student who um, doesn't have internet access, but he's in a calculus two class. So we're doing a lot of things that we need to to help kids stay connected with their teachers. But for the concurrent enrolled students, as we know, those are dual enrolled, they get high school and college credit. Next slide, please. And so in terms of their high school uh, credits, they um, have a little bit of control. In terms of their Marshalltown Community College credits, all of that has been determined by Marshalltown. Um, the, the teachers came back online on the 25th. These classes include Project Lead the Way. Next slide. Um, some of the students will um, end up like the certified nurses aides are going to end up with an incomplete, which on our transcript means uh, they were not eligible for their next se athletic season. So we will uh, be very mindful of what's happening with those students and they'll have to have a little waiver because they have absolutely no control over that incomplete because they cannot complete their clinicals until it is safe to do so. Um, our career and technical classes, students are going into the MCC and working on their labs. And we actually have some students who are still working with those businesses that are open and serving uh, meals to go. Finally, our concurrent students can make a decision about their high school transcript, transcript and how they want their course learning to be uh, represented again on the high school transcript, they get to use any one of the three options that we previously reviewed, which includes again, taking the letter grade as it appears in Infinite Campus, which will have an impact on their GPA. Uh, slide two, um, the option to take the pass, no pass, which will not impact their GPA, but will still give them the high school credit. And it's important for our um, students going on to college to uh, really think about how a pass, no pass may appear on their transcript for college admissions, and especially for those special programs that have particular admittance, admittance requirements like an engineering class over at the Iowa State. Um, so that's important. Again, consult your school counselor. And finally, their MCC transcript is dictated by Marshalltown Community College. So the grade that appears um, uh, in Infinite Campus will be the grade that appears on their transcript at MCC and will be calculated into the MCC GPA as well as grant the MCC credit. And so we included that contact information there for MCC if they have any concerns about their MCC transcripted grade. So how will students notify the school about their decision? Um, on the next slide, we are going to send out emails to personally to, to students. Again, they have till May 28th to make that decision. Um, we are also sending a mailing that was prepared today 
in both English and Spanish with a document or a form in English and Spanish um, that students can fill out and return to the school if they don't have internet access. But we wanted this information to go home in a letter to all households to make sure that um, everyone is accessing the information, whether online or through that paper document and fully aware of the choices that are available to them. So next slide just basically is acknowledging that, you know, they have a lot of questions and there's just a few of the questions that they're still asking about. What about my cap and gown? What about my, the stuff I left in my locker? Um, so those are things that our team will be tackling first thing in the morning. We've already started processing some of it and we just need to set up some times and dates and cap and gowns. We've already got a date for those, so we're good. Um, and the last slide just includes a lot of contact information for our students and parents in terms of our grade level teams and how to get a hold of them. Any questions? Well, this circles back to what we were just talking about. You talked about taking um, materials to the calculus student. Mm -hmm. How close are we being able to get a hotspot to him so he would have internet access? Is that something um, we're that would be uh, Amy question. <laughs> yeah, Amy. Um, the answer is I don't really know. I'm hoping sometime this week we'll get the delivery, but we don't have the hotspots yet to give out. But they have been ordered a few weeks ago and have been shipped. So one of the other things that um, when I visited with our staff this morning and we were talking about uh, virtual meetings with them is one of the things that I shared is that you can, when you con contact a student by phone or by text message or by remind, the teachers can send out the phone number and the password or passcode for a virtual meeting. And just like we have uh, Ms. Nibblack joining us via phone, students can do the same thing. They can join uh, via phone. And so that's that was, I think, a, just a little technology piece that may have slept some of the teachers' minds um, as they think about their meeting times. And so uh, that's a quick thing to do. Again, if they've already made it, making contact via phone or Remind or text message or whatever to, uh, app they're using, um, they can just send that link along and it would be another beneficial thing for our students. Any other questions? Yep. Are there other questions for Mrs. Wyatt? Do you have a sense of when you'll be able to decide what you'll do about graduation? Um, we, Dr. Sheet and I were back and forth on a couple of things. And um, we, I do know that one third of the students have replied that they would like to have the ceremony, even if it's later in the summer. One third of the parents have indicated the same thing. And um, we're trying to figure out a, a way to still give them that that walking across the stage feel, um, because I, I, you know, if if I had to guess, I don't. I'm not sure that we're going to be ready in the summer. Uh, I'm not sure with the the way things continue to spike. And so, uh, we we we're hoping the next couple of weeks there, Bob. Any other questions? Thank you. Dr. Schutte, is this an action item? Yes, we had hoped for it to be an action item. It, it looked like it was. Um, is there a motion to approve the Marshalltown High School grading options due to school closure COVID-19? Move for approval. Back. Uh, Hernandez unteed. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wyatt. Uh, we're on to handbooks. Start with Rex. I assume I saw Rex in here, so Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, we reformatted the handbook uh, real quick. On the first page, we added the transportation to and from daycare uh, would be provided if the student qualifies uh, from their primary home address. Uh, this goes along with the board policy. 
so we just put that in there so that was clear. Uh, we still work with families uh, on a case-by-case -case situation if need be, but this is our primary thing. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that was included in there. On the next page, just some changes of some wording in there. Uh, yeah, yeah, making sure that these families are registering with the school. Sometimes they're calling here one busing set up and they haven't even registered at, their, at the schools so that the school knows they're coming. So we want to clarify that with them. And uh, the other thing is making sure we can get those letters out. We put some things in place this year. Uh, we're hoping to have letters out uh, in late uh, June uh, for early July. Uh, we don't, so we won't be needing to wait as long for registration, which kind of pushed us on that back end. So those, those uh, two changes there, just uh, you know, when we're getting information to them and that they make sure they get uh, registered with the school and the school and transportation both uh, communicate with them on pickup times, drop off times if they qualify, if they don't give them reasons why they don't qualify. Uh, then not the next page, the uh, following page, uh, regular routes, again, just uh, putting in there about the board policy uh, and reminding them about if they move from one residence to another into another school zone and they want to stay there, that that is their responsibility to transport their child unless there's an administrative decision there. Uh, I work with the principals and stuff on, the, on what's happening there, and we work with that, but we just wanted, again, to make sure that was in there and that was clear to parents, because we have some that are moving, and uh, they just want that uh, transportation to continue, so uh, we, we work with them. And then uh, down at the lower part of the page, uh, we have some kids, when they get off the bus, uh, they'll start walking down the sidewalk, and then they cross right behind the bus. And we're just asking them uh, never cross behind the bus and reinforce that in our uh, when we do our bus training with them and uh, make, get their attention there. Those were all the changes except the last on the very last page. Uh, when you adopt a, a seatbelt policy, uh, then that would be a part of that. And then just uh, Dr. Ryan put in there. Uh, versus Josh, Josh when he was there. So those are the only changes to the handbook. Questions for Rex? I would say I noticed um, in all the other handbooks that we're going to look at, there's uh, some there's McKinney Vento transitional housing homelessness language in there. I don't know if that should be needs to be in the transportation handbook, but I know there's some transportation stuff that's impacted by that. So I, I, I don't know. That's more a question than anything else. Uh, it, we, when we receive those letters, uh, they already uh, qualify and we just work with the school and the counselor and the family and get everything set up for them. Okay. Anything else for Rex? Thank you, Rex. Thank you. Uh, the preschool handbook is next up. Yes. Um, so thank you to Emily Banks for going in and reviewing um, our handbook that had a, a major revision last year to make um, it aligned with this Department of Education's preschool audit. Um, so what you'll see in here is a lot of references to IQ PPS, which is Iowa Quality Program Preschool Standards. Um, so things that you should note are highlighted in yellow. The only really big changes um, is that we noted that we are expanding the three-year-old only program um, from one site to two, which was on page one. Um, so instead of just having that at uh, Fisher, we'll also have a classroom at Hoagland um, this August or whenever we go back to school. Um, and you'll actually, I think, see that on the personnel agenda tonight too. Um, and then on the last page, sorry, Emily, or I'm sorry, Amy, for making you go back. Um, the other thing that you wanted to know is, might want to know is we cleaned up some transportation language on 
the end. Um, transportation is on the in the end of the preschool handbook because when we first had a preschool program, we didn't have transportation. So this has just been within the last few years. And every year we learn a little bit more and Rex has helped us too. So once Rex's handbook has been approved, we'll go ahead and link the updated link in there. Um, we do have updated board policies linked, but um, we just wanted um, the public to understand too that we are not busing three-year-olds um, unless they are, um, unless they have an IEP, they're in special education that requires busing, um, but we do bus four-year-olds. Um, that's not guaranteed due to our limited bus um, availability and um, space on the routes that we have. Busing is offered on a first come first serve basis. And we did have some um, instances this year where that was a challenge. And so we wanted to make sure that we were very clear with families that um, sort of like what Rex was saying that, um, you know, we might, not have any issues busing your child in August with the information you've given us, but if you move or other things happen, it becomes very challenging to add and, and modify routes, especially with children that age and sticking to um, the departments of ed's um, regulations on minutes that the wheels are running or rolling. Um, we also in the past were very um, stringent on not letting any K-12 students um, ride on the preschool buses and vice versa. And I wanted to reflect some updated information we received from um, Des Moines that said, we do have local ability to make some um, decisions in that regard. So if there is an older sibling and we don't have space, et cetera, we may serve the preschool child on an elementary bus or vice versa. So those are the two up, big updates that are in the preschool handbook. Could you explain why we would not want preschoolers on the bus with older children? Can you repeat that one more time? I guess I didn't know there was a regulation that you couldn't have three and four year olds on the bus with older children. That's puzzling. Why would that be? Um, mostly, I think those decisions had been made in the past due to funding streams. So um, almost everything that happens in terms of serving four-year-olds and statewide voluntary preschool programming is um, funded, coded, aligned with the budget that we get for that only every year. And that included transportation. So I think that was kind of the, the rationale behind why we weren't trying to mingle the little kids on the K-12 gen, general ed funded bus routes and vice versa. Does that make sense, Jan? But then we um, got some mm -hmm. updated information this, I don't know, when was that Rex? Maybe like back in February or so um, that we, if needed, could allow for that to happen, but it's not um, best practice for lots of reasons because um, you know when you're serving four-year-olds, we're trying to maintain a 10 to one ratio. And we know that's not happening on the big kid buses. Um, we have monitors in place on the preschool buses. We don't have those in place on all the K-12 buses. Um, we do door-to-door -door pickup with some um, rules about an adult being present at pickup and drop off. And so I think, you know, I think it's just us being very protective of the four-year-olds and them getting to school safely and back, which um, had been a system we were really comfortable with, um, with the preschool only buses. Um, and that's something that we'll strive to do. But I think what this allows us to do is make exceptions with Rex and the family's approval. So if, if the child had an older sibling to ride with, they would feel a little more protected, I suppose. Okay. Right, possibly, right. So the preschooler could go um, with the older sibling on that bus. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated situation for lots of reasons, just even thinking about when buses arrive at the schools and getting the little four-year-old, you know, into the preschool classroom versus, you know, getting shuffled into breakfast or to the playground. It, it, it's a little bit, um, it's not as safe as we would like it to be. And so that's why we, re we reserve the right to try to keep them as separate as possible, but also know that there'll be rare exceptions when we might need to, to change that. Okay. Other questions for Dr. Stevenson?
Okay, thank you, Dr. Stevenson. You're welcome. Who's here for the elementary handbooks? I think Ronnie, possibly. I saw him and I think I saw Tim in the Holmgren in the participants. I don't know if he was just here to attend or if he was going to talk. I'm here. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, handbook doesn't have a lot of major changes. Uh, one thing that could change based upon tonight's meeting uh, under attendance on page one, we do have start times there, which uh, could change based on information later tonight. Um, most of the changes that I made were ease of access uh, pieces under bus transportation. I just simply added the link to the bus trans district transportation handbook. Um, page two, we, we obviously just updated uh, PD days for next year and I also added a link to the calendar there for parents who may wanna see it. Uh, nothing on page three or page four. Page five, again, just uh, simply adding a link so the parents could get to uh, information they may need more quickly. Uh, we did add uh, the McKinney-Vento Act has been added and students in uh, a new topic, students in transitional housing or homelessness, uh, just kind of gives the parents a definition of what that act does, what it's for, and gives them Mr. Gosling as number in case they need some support uh, with that topic. And just a simple thing, adding the uh, link to the MCSD school volunteer application on the final page. Otherwise, that are all the changes that uh, the principals and I came up with for this year. Any questions on that? Uh, you addressed my one question, which was going to be the start time thing. Uh, yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Who's on for Lenahan? Kyle, are you there? Hey, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. <laughs> I'd never done a Zoom meeting where I was on the on the outside looking in there, so it was it was uh, it was weird for me. I was like, "When does this happen?" Um, okay. So our handbook is, for the most part, cleaning up um, some things to make it more consistent. Um, we changed uh, some food service language in there to address the community eligibility piece. Um, that moved up for our students uh, this last year. Um, we changed the uh, head lice um, piece to be consistent with the uh, K-4 buildings, added the um, homeless, homeless housing and transitional housing piece in there as well. And then um, also in anticipation of, uh, of later, we added uh, some changes to our start and uh, our start time, which I believe um, is going to be different. I need to change that because I have the I have our end time wrong. I have it ending at three twenty five. Questions for Mr. Young? All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mr. Young. Dave, are you representing middle? Dave or Pat? It looks like Pat's in there, but I don't see Dave anymore. 
Pat? I'm here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if you want to, we got quite a few changes and we did a lot of cleanup this year. Um, if you look at the main page there, we added some links in there, the important links that parents can see. And then there's an opening letter to not only parents and students, uh, and we updated that um, with the correct names in there now. And then the table of contents, that's all new. It's not highlighted. I thought that would be a lot of highlighting going on, but that's all new. That way it gives the user very easy access to what pages they need to go to. And then we added the mission statement, uh, mission, vision, and beliefs. Uh, and then on page seven, we have the, the homelessness, uh, the federal le legislation. And then page eight, we have our new start time. 825. And then on page nine, we have the editions of Van Chromebooks. Page 10, 11, and 12, we added class descriptions to our related arts classes. Um, you can see there the teachers uh, were so kind to do that for us. And then we uh, crossed off the geometry class for eighth grade. Um, Go to page 15. Uh, report cards are just gonna be mailed out uh, once a semester. We used to do it each quarter, um, but with the access to online, uh, once a semester is what we decided on. Page 17, uh, we added a student PBIS team, which they uh, prepare some of our celebrations in the quarter assemblies and so forth. Page 20, which we have the withdrawal from school and make sure that they turn in their Chromebooks and chargers prior to leaving. Um, page 21 and 22, uh, academic uh, and athletics students must be in good standing in all classes to participate in contests and performances. If students not in good standing, they will need to meet a teacher's recommendation to participate in contests and performances making significant progress towards passing as required. Um, and then if we want to go down to page 22, um, this one's in there new, uh, all students, whether participating or spectating for an MMS event must have been in attendance all day to attend the contest or have approval from an administrator. What we so find sometimes is kids will miss school all day, but yet they'll show up for an event that night. And that's, we want them in school in order to be at an event. Page 27. We added just some language for backpacks. Um, their teachers could designate a spot in the classroom to put their backpacks that way. There's good flow with flow and traffic in the classroom. And page also on page 27, uh, we have organizers in each classroom. Basically, their their shoe racks, plastic shoe racks, where kids can put their uh, it says digital devices, but their phones basically. So. Um, we can do that. And then page 32, just the open enrollment day for next year. Any questions? Hopefully that's a lot cleaner than it has been in the past, uh, especially with that table of contents in there. Questions for Pat? I did like the table of contents. That's, that's nice. And, and I like that the, uh, I assume that'll be the same way when it goes on the website that all those, the end, if the table of contents, the page numbers are all hyperlinked. So you can just click on the page number, go right to the page, which is nice. I just have a comment about the, the cell phone. I don't think a teacher should have to justify asking a student to put away their cell phone. They shouldn't have to prove that it's interfering with learning. I think you could run into some issues with that. It's a language thing, but it's the type of thing that could be argued. And I think we need to avoid that at the middle school level. I think, uh, Jen, with the expectation that students are to put their cell phones in those slots when they come into the classroom, if they don't do that, 
<clears throat> teachers aren't going to, you know, search them or wait them out to put them in there. But if that phone then comes out during class and it wasn't in the slot, that's all the justification that they need. That's the way it should be. I agree. Right. Okay. I have, I have a question, have a question regarding, regarding the, the uh, uh, A question, a question regarding, regarding the um, semester mailing of report cards. Card. Will, there Will there be, be a contact, contact with, with parents, parents then um, during, during the other, the other quarters? quarters? It's where our conferences align. They're, they're right on the quarters, our conference, our conference times. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I assume that Jackie is still hanging out to talk about the high school handbook. I think Mrs. Holzhoppel will be doing that tonight. Oh, okay. Deb, are you there? Hi, how are you? Hello. Um, I'm here to share with you our um, handbook. And we really just did a lot of cleaning up of language and different personnel. So um, I just lost my notes. <laughs> um, we, um, a, on page three, we just added um, Dr. Ryan's information instead of um, Anthony's. And then the table of contents will all be updated as, after it's been approved to be hyperlinked to the sections um, because every time we adjust it, it changes. If you go to page nine, we will put in the new um, class schedule with having the adjusted start time. That's going to change things just a little bit. So that just needs to be updated. Then if you keep going down, um, to, sorry, I've lost my notes. We've added the transitional housing and homeless like the other schools have. And then um, we updated the um, mission statement for the district there. And then further down, you'll see some little changes such as dates, um, just some more specific um, wording for more clarity. And like Jan was saying, less um, chances of argument, I guess you would say, over certain things. So that's really what's been changed as you go through this. The majority of our changes took place um, down around page 56, where we're talking more about the athletics because of their um, changes in the different conferences. And that also leads to um, differences in the suspensions and how many games and things like that. So that's where the bulk of our changes came from. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. We just need to update the hyperlinks and the actual page numbers once it's approved. 
Questions for Mrs. Holzhabel? Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. So these will all be back at our next meeting for approval. So tonight was your first chance to ask some questions about them. They'll come back next, next time for approval. Um, all right, moving on. Mr. Kretzinger. Good evening. You're up. All right. So following up to last board meeting, I wanna to talk to you about the multi-tiered system support as it relates to social emotional learning. I apologize, I got my second screen over here, so I'm gonna be staring over here a whole lot. So I wanna start off just reminding us about social emotional learning and behavior. Uh, Amy, you have us on the right slide. It's important that we think about social emotional development is the same as any other area. If a student can't do it, we teach them. Um, oftentimes people confuse the, when we use the phrase discipline as in punishment, and really it has no relationship to it. So if we have a student who's struggling on their social emotional skills, our obligation is to teach them those skills. Amy, next slide, please. And so we've adopted a philosophy here in the district that kids do well if they can. And if they're not doing well, it's because there's something getting in their way. Um, and we talk about lagging skills. And our job is to help them find a way to apply that appropriately. Next slide, please. So just like English language arts, math, science, social studies, the state of Iowa this year adopted social emotional learning standards. And you can see a summary of them in the image. Uh, the document's 70 pages for some light reading if anyone's interested. But essentially there are five domains and 19 competencies or learning targets they really want us to focus on. And as a district, we knew this work was being developed at the state level. So over the last two years, we've worked with some of our community partners on our AEA to develop what we call our social emotional learning framework. It's one of the documents I shared um, or Dr. Schutte shared with you within news and notes. And so if you wanna get down to a deep level of detail about what are we doing across various levels of support, that document will show you everything we're trying to accomplish in our schools and the research behind it. Next slide, please. But beginning with supporting all of our students, we need to establish expectations with them. Marshalltown continues to use positive behavioral interventions and supports as the initial framework we use. And each building has a PBIS team and they've worked over the years to develop common expectations across settings, classrooms, lunch rooms, hallways, out at recess. Over the last couple of years, we've really focused on trying to avoid some of the common pitfalls that come under um, PBIS implementation. If you've done it for a while, you sometimes drift into some practices. So the first one is we don't want to assume that a child knows what's expected of them when they're in your classroom or in the hallway or in the lunchroom. We want to make sure we're teaching them those expectations and teaching them means not only are we running through it with them, but they're having an opportunity to practice them and see what it's supposed to look like. And it's also good to have some examples of what it's not supposed to look like so they know the difference. We wanna teach them multiple times a year. Just like with us, going over something one time doesn't guarantee it's gonna stick. So we wanna practice it several times a year. And most commonly you see those practiced after uh, breaks or any time a building is looking at their data and seeing that there's a common pattern of an expectation not being met. And then one of the big focuses is about acknowledging students when they're doing exactly what we want them to do. Um, in many cases, if you talk about PBIS with folks, they'll tend to think that it's about rewarding kids. And they'll do things like giving tickets or giving little toys or giving candy. And that can be part of it. But the development of PBIS was really about acknowledging kids for doing the things we want them to do. And that acknowledgement gives us an opportunity to build a relationship with our kids. So 
saying nice job. I really like how you're staying connected. You're staying accountable, keeping your hands to yourself. You're focused on your work, doing high fives. Any kind of that positive attention is really where PPIS came from. So we want to do all we can to leverage those opportunities to develop positive relationships with our kids. Now, how we teach the skills that we talk about um, begin with our social emotional learning curriculum for all kids through our guidance, and that's positive action. We've adopted it and began it this year. And positive action gives us an opportunity once every six days for either our school counselors to directly or through consultation with a classroom teacher cover at least one of the lessons in there that line up to the domains shown earlier in the Iowa social emotional learning competencies. It becomes a little more challenging when you move into the high school. So that's where collaboration and, and teaching those lessons through homeroom, um, that homeroom structure becomes unique structure for us. This year, we also brought in capturing kids' hearts. When you move from the middle school and into the high school, it's sometimes difficult to develop really good relationships with students if you're seeing a new face every 45 minutes. So capturing kids' hearts is an evidence-based approach that helps educators learn how to build those strong relationships in those short periods of time. We we're really pleased with the training that happened and we're excited to see what happens as these buildings get more used to working in this structure as well. Next slide, please. Just like we do for academics, for social emotional needs, we screen students three times a year. We use a, a tool called the SABER, which is the Social Academic and Emotional Behavior Risk Scale. It's a real brief scale. Uh, it takes between two and four minutes per student to complete. And teachers complete it three times a year looking at different aspects of a child's social emotional needs. If within that, um, after the screener's completed, if we see their total score is elevated, then it gives us an opportunity to look deeper into their data and see if they have further needs. I think one of the big strengths of the SABER beyond allowing us to be proactive in our service instead of waiting for things to get so bad that we're reactive. We can also dig a little deeper into the information and see what about their um, behaviors created that elevated score. So was it something to do with their social behavior? Was it something to do with their academic behaviors that allow them to engage in classwork? Or is something going on with the emotional side of their behaviors and some of those, um, those quiet kids we see in class possibly that might be dealing with anxiety or some of the stressors that don't show up as easily as some of the other behaviors. Next slide, please. So if a student has an elevated scale on SABER or as Building teams come together and they look at their data. You might see students who are also having challenges with attendance, also having challenges with office referrals. This convergence of data then helps teams figure out which students need targeted intervention, which we call tier two. There are a variety of different approaches we can use and I've listed some there. Uh, the collaborative problem solving approach is one of the newer ones that we've been developing further. But each building has a unique structure. So the main guidelines are that each building will have a set of rules that they use to decide which students need intervention, which students don't need intervention, and how are they gonna collect data on those interventions to see if they're making a difference. Next slide, please. Now there are a few students that won't respond the way we want them to, to the work that's being done to this point. And so we move to tier three or intensive intervention. And at this juncture, we're looking to just intensify instruction with them. And what that means is um, we're gonna get a little more specific and targeted in what we do. So to intensify instruction, we might teach them more often. We might teach them for a little bit longer. The group size might get quite a bit smaller when we work with them. We might be very intentional and specific on either strategies we use or instructional materials we select to work with them. But the system stays the same as it did in tier two where buildings will define what kinds of interventions are needed, what kind of data they're gonna collect to decide whether a student is responding to that intervention or not, 
And what are the guidelines to decide who needs intervention and who's ready to step back into our lower level of intervention? And I think that's really important to think about is when we're at an intensive intervention like tier three and students are being successful, we don't completely exit them from intervention. We're going to move them backward in the process the same way we've moved them forward in the process. Now for a really small number of our students who won't respond to intensive intervention, our AEA has a structure that takes them through what's called disability suspected. And that's the introduction of the process to determine if a child would be eligible for special education related services. So everything we've talked about is gen ed to this point. And if a student is found eligible for special ed and related services, then there's an entire continuum of supports in that area um, that we won't go through tonight. But essentially it begins with supporting kids in classrooms and has a variety of steps all the way to being considered for our therapeutic classrooms within our Four Oaks setting. To do this work, it's not something Marshalltown has just done by themselves. So I did wanna show you all the organizations that work together to come up with this continuum of service and this collaborative process as well as highlight some of the common professional learning we've made available to our staff currently or look to in the future. Next slide, please. Now moving forward, I knew that Director Miller most likely would have some questions for me. So I put some information together ahead of time to see if I could answer his questions and read his mind. So, just to make sure the entire board is on the same page, because we've talked about this work a couple times now over the last few years. During the 18-19 school year, we spent seven focused hours on social emotional learning as a district. And during that time, between first semester and second semester, we saw a 43% reduction in the need to use physical management or restraint and seclusion with a student. So that was a really positive indicator for us. In addition to that, we surveyed both our certified and our classified staff, at least a paraeducator group of the classified staff, to see if they agreed upon the work that we were focused on over that seven hours of professional learning. And you can see the overwhelming majority said, yes, we're doing the right work and it is important. Next slide, please. During that same last year, we had developed what we called the Social Emotional Learning Steering Committee. It was made up of about 25 members. It had administrators, central office folks, school counselors, school resource specialists, teachers, and AEA staff as part of it. So it was a large group that covered most positions across the district. And this committee developed five goals that they wanted to accomplish during the 18-19 school year. And you can see those goals in the image on the right. We put out a survey to our staff members also asking if they felt that the professional learning and the work done in the buildings beyond the learning met those goals. And you can see how well they agreed with those questions. So coming out of the 18-19 school year, we felt really positive about our work because we were really shooting for that 80% agreement. And in every case, we met that 80% threshold. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, because of school closure, some of those data points are hard to share because we would be in the middle of collecting them right now. But there are some data points I can talk about this school year that continue to um, inform us we're on the right path. So what you're seeing here is data from the Conditions for Learning Survey. Now to make sure everyone understands, Conditions for Learning Survey is an anonymous survey given out to all students in sixth through 12th grade once a year. It's given out by the Iowa Department of Education and it is one of those indicators used on the state performance profiles to determine um, a ranking of our school. The bottom part of the graph in front of you has the 18-19 school year. And you can see that there's five domains that the questions focus on. Adult student relationships, emotional safety, expectations and boundaries, physical safety, and student-to-student -student relationships. Now, it's kind of hard to follow the way the Department of Ed has moved this data around because they didn't use the same questions from year to year and change some of the values. 
So what we were able to do is go in and create a color coding system. Anything in that pinkish, orangish, reddish color, it indicates that we were below the state average in that indicator for that year. And anything in white means that we were at or above the state average in that indicator for the year. So when I look at this information and I look at the bottom part of the graphic that's the 1819 school year compared to the top part that's the 1920, what that tells me is that our students are reporting that they feel um, improved student relationships, emotional safety, expectations and boundaries, physical safety and student student relationships. We are also at or above the state average of all school districts who have taken this uh, conditions for learning survey. Um, I see a lot of growth here. And if you look at the very left column, that's the composite area. And I'm not going to get into explaining T scores because it's one of those statistic things that will put everyone to sleep really quickly. But essentially, you know, the T score range is telling us how well we think we're doing comparing information across multiple assessments. And if you look about the 1819 to 1920, we continued to be at or above the state average and show improvement in that area as well. So I know it's a hard graphic to follow, but essentially our students are telling us that our learning environments are improving from their perspective. Next slide, please. And then our social emotional screener, the SABERS. When we look at data compared to the two times this year we were able to give it out, you can see that between um, the assessment completed in the fall and winter, there was a significant drop in a number of students that met that some risk, that level of concern or elevated scale across every attendance center here. So that's really exciting news because it tells me that our teachers have less concern about the social emotional needs of our kids compared comparatively on this screener. Next slide, please. Now a new piece of data that we started collecting this year is what we're calling walkthrough data. And it's through this assessment tool called KickUp. As we began this process, one of the things we wanted to do is get direct observational data on how our uh, social emotional skills and social emotional structures being implemented within our schools in a day to day. So working with our area education agency, we created a plan where they would walk through every school and look in every classroom. And they would use a rubric to score on 15 components, what they were observing on the social emotional interaction. Now they didn't get through all schools before um, we moved into closure, but they did get through seven of our schools. And so the data here is about seven of our schools. Of the 15 aspects, when you look at all the schools information combined, 11 of the 15 aspects, they have directly observed healthy learning environment interactions. So that's, that's great news because that's exactly the kind of information we wanna see. And we had three areas where they noted we excelled at. And those are positive and respectful interactions among adults in the classroom. Students have positive and respectful communication with adults and our trauma-informed practices. And trauma-informed practices really mean the implementation of collaborative problem solving to address mental health situations, stress, anxiety, and fears. So that's really good information from our initial walkthrough. We look forward to completing those last three schools and adding it to this data down the road at some point. And the last slide is, what questions do you have for me? Questions for Matt. Uh, one question, Matt, you talked about your therapeutic classrooms. Can you tell me approximately what percent of our students are involved in the therapeutic classrooms? Yeah, the program agreement sets it up. We have three therapeutic classrooms, one's in elementary, one's a middle school, um, intermediate middle school, and one's a high school level. And we're allowed to have up to six students per classroom. So we consistently stay at that 18 student threshold. And then the other question actually had to do with one of the graphics you have here. Let me find it again. 
I was, I, it was the one that was, that was difficult to interpret. The conditions, the conditions for, for learning. learning survey. Yes. Um, I'm trying to figure out like physical safety when you've got a score 55 and then you come up here and it's 43. I don't know if the 55 is better or worse. What do they mean by that? I don't know what that number means. Well, that's the challenge is that as they change the questions and the dynamics of the assessment, they couldn't compare the scores apples to apples. So of the people who took the survey in 1819, 55.6% reported that they felt that it was a physically safe environment to be in. In 1920, 43.01% of the folks. They but they the changed up the question so much that the Iowa Department of Education didn't feel that they could compare years without going through a T-score conversion. Okay. So, so generally, it's more positive in the newer scores, but in some cases, it's difficult to interpret. Yes, that's why I did the color coding, working with our Department of Ed. When they saw that we in most categories are at or above the state level, their interpretation was the same as mine of that's a very positive indicator. And our profile mm -hmm. looks better than many school districts in the state. Because just like moving from the Iowa assessments to the ISASP, because yes. of the type of questions that were asked, most school districts saw a drop in their performance scores. Okay. All right. Matt, it might be nice to see the average to compare to compare ours to. Okay. I can get that for you. Other questions for Matt? Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Dr. Stevenson, you're back up. Um, yep. And Tonight, what I would like is to ask for board action um, on the next document, sorry, um, which is the revised um, bell times, start and end bell times for the 2021 school year that I had reviewed at the April 6th board meeting. As a reminder, we're adding 10 minutes um, to the students stay at the elementary level. K-4, we're adding five minutes to Lenahan's student day, student instructional day, and then also five minutes at Miller and the high school. Questions for Dr. Stevenson? I'm gonna make a motion to approve those changes. Is that what you're asking for? Well, before we do, are there any questions for Dr. Stevenson? Okay, Jan, I'll take your motion now. All right. I'm on move that we approve the change in uh, time times as presented last at the last board meeting. Second. Uh, McGinnis Miller, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. You're still in the hot seat. Okay, next item is the kindergarten, uh, kindergarten, sixth grade social studies, and Thank seventh you. Grade English language arts. My eyes are glaring. <laughs> I'm just staring at the screen all day. Um, yes, so at the April 6th board meeting, I presented for information only um, some budget information regarding um, the elementary social studies adoption, which is a um, part of our seven year adoption cycle. So I'm asking for action tonight to approve the requests listed on this document 
um, to allow us to update and upgrade our resources for K-6 social studies to align with the new Iowa social studies standards. May I have a motion to adopt the kindergarten through sixth grade social studies uh, materials and curriculum as presented? So moved. Second. Niblock Faltus? Yep. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries 7-0. Um, the second part of that um, was the <laughs> sorry, the 712 um, English language arts adoption. That team had also been in curriculum review as part of our seven year cycle throughout this school year. And on April 6th at the last board meeting, you were presented information regarding the process and the estimated expenses to purchase new English language arts resources for core and elective courses at Miller and the high school and MLA. So I'm asking for action this evening to approve these budget items. May I have a motion um, to approve the uh, 712 English language arts material adoption as presented? Uh, so moved. I move that we that the ELA materials adoption recommendations as presented. Second. Uh, McGinnis Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed would say no. Motion carries seven zero. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Thank you very much on behalf of the teachers that were on those teams and the teachers that will receive those materials and our students who will get to learn with them next school year. B, are you ready to go on uh, habit 25 of how not to be a terrible board member? Yes, if this continues to work. Okay. Okay, 25 is about news to the board table. It's assuming that you prefer to ignore the fact that all board members are elected in a nonpartisan way. When you were elected on the ballot, you did not have a Republican or Democratic uh, um, signature next to your name. Everyone was considered to be apolitical in that regard. So the Am I back? You are now. Or am I still gone? You're back. I think I'm back. So let's <laughs> forge ahead. And if nobody can hear me, sorry. What we need to understand is that we need to see the issues through the lens of what's best for children of the desert. 
you were elected to serve all of the people. So you need to see the um, terms and issues as to what is best for the children of the district and facing the problems of the district rather than um, upholding party principles. That's about what I can do for you. Hope you were able Thank you, B. That's why I had uh, habit 26, do a favor. And uh, what, <clears throat> what the scenario was, was a board member was out walking their dog and their neighbor came running up to him from gardening and uh, started to share a story of concern relative to how her child was uh, being accused of not turning homework in uh, by the teacher and the parent was adamant that homework had been turned in and had been graded differently than was being projected. Um, the parent had a legitimate concern and it had gotten to the point where it had been so upsetting to the daughter that uh, the parent was asking the board member to have the daughter moved out of her teacher's class into another class. And uh, the board member tried to appease the parent by sharing some inappropriate confidential information relative to information evidently that board member knew about some uh, medical issues that the teacher was dealing with that also basically said, I'll talk to the principal and get your child moved, which the board member didn't have the um, authority to do. So the moral to the story uh, kind of goes back to the appropriate chain of command and how as a board member, you do have a responsibility to provide a listening ear uh, to those types of concerns and then to redirect the parent uh, to making sure that the appropriate steps are taken. So first and foremost, has the parent talked to the teacher about this? If so, and not satisfied, have they taken it to the principal? And if so, not satisfied, have they taken it to the superintendent before expecting the board member to um, handle it for them? Um, and I think the reinforcement there is just the importance for number one, board members who do represent their, the people of the school community to provide a listening here, to attempt to provide correct direction in terms of how to walk through that appropriate chain of command. And if nothing else, then you know, to make sure the superintendent's aware so that they can um, direct it to the appropriate person and also follow up with the board member. So once a board member has passed that information along, then to ultimately um, for the superintendent and or other director to report back to the board member in terms of it having been handled. Anyone else have anything to add to that one? It's a pretty common uh, occurrence for board members. And so it's really important to try to stay the course on, you know, directing people the right way and, and uh, doing what we can. And ultimately, if all else fails, reach out to the superintendent, let them try to help direct traffic with it. Right, it, it's, a, it's a fairly common scenario where someone has a problem and, and they want you to fix it and, and they haven't done all the things that they need to do. And so being able to redirect them and, and point them back towards where they need to start on the chain of command is, is very important. As a teacher, I totally agree. <laughs> All right, Lisa, you're back up one more time. Okay, um, habit 
27 is accepting gifts. And in this case, there was a board member who had a conversation with uh, the high school principal and then in a different conversation with a different principal. And in both cases, the principals um, bestowed passes um, to the board member to allow the board member to get in um, at no cost to athletic events or um, fine arts events. And um, that is a terrible habit according to what we read because it um, could be seen as a bribe by some um, community members, especially because the board member has the ability to vote on projects that um, may or may not support one school or another in terms of their facilities. Um, and the recommended action um, would be to just not use those free passes, uh, to pay your own way when attending um, ticketed school events. Um, and I think that the one thing too that I walked away from that was just um, the lessons learned at the end was thinking about the importance, especially as you bring on new principals to your district or new administrators, um, to just remind them of what the policy is in those situations so that um, you have some consistent language that's gone out to your building administrators um, about what to do or not to do in terms of those passes. Um, and then that way you're kind of stopping the problem before it starts. You're not putting the board member in a position um, where a principal has done or not done something um, in regards to ticketed entry or things that have a monetary value that they're accepting. It really helps as someone who's often had this duty where you're selling these tickets at these events, it really helps to have it written down which people are supposed to get in without paying admittance, whether it's teachers or, or coaches or referees or board members, um, they can get pretty murky. I mean, it sounds like it should be simple, but it really isn't. And it puts the teacher in a really uncomfortable position. If someone comes up and says, well, I've never had to pay before, but the teacher's been told to have them pay. So it really helps to make all of that clear. Anything else from anybody? Well, I had the last one, Habit 28, uh, radiate negative energy. Uh, the scenario here is that the school board has been uh, engaged in discussion and, and conversation for about a year about closing one particular school building. Uh, and on the night of the big vote, uh, they have more discussion and everybody has to say what they want to say and then they take a vote and our member is on the wrong side I guess in his opinion of the vote uh, and so the vote is done and the meeting is coming to a conclusion and he has one last thing to say and he says that this is the worst decision the school board has ever made in all of his years of service and they've done a disservice to all the kids and if his if he was a parent at that school he would be looking for a different place to send his kids. Uh, and so the moral, I guess, to me is summed up uh, in a couple of sentences that says the vote has been taken. The decision is now the policy of the district and your responsibility is to do all you can to make it work. You should strive to assist rather than obstruct the district in its quest to provide high quality education for everyone. Um, I guess to me, I think it's appropriate to have disagreements. It's appropriate to have conversations about things and, and we don't all see things the same way. Um, there are difficult votes that are taken at times uh, and, and they don't go necessarily the way we always want them to do. Um, but once the board takes action, I think it's, it's your responsibility as a board member to support that decision uh, and, and not to get in the way, but to, to help make those decisions uh, work for the best of all the kids uh, in the district. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Okay, we, we have concluded our book study for the year. Uh, 
hopefully we've all learned many lessons from our intrepid board member and and will now not be bad school board members. So. I think we're over to Dr. Ryan. All right, thank you. Um, Sean, I can see you on my screen. If I randomly mute, which my computer likes to do, will you just kind of wave your arms? I'll, I'll take my cue from you. It, it works fine. It's just randomly will mute. Okay, so on the agenda, I am asking um, for the board's approval to move forward with the purchase of two platforms through PowerSchool, one being the applicant tracking. And that is, again, just a reminder from last meeting is to be able to create customized applications, um, be more digital, more flexible, and have um, and, and really easy to make somebody go from an applicant to an employee and affording the directors and the administrators a lot of a lot more flexibility with looking at those applications. And then also the platform of HR records, and that is to 100% digitize all of our HR um, documents and so people can um, change their profiles there. Just today I had um, four emails directly to me and I, I can't speak to how many went to my administrative assistant um, of emails asking um, two of them were like a change address. Um, somebody was wanting to change their deduction on a or take extra taxes out on their W-4. So all things like that could be done digitally. And then one that's really relevant to right now I've got, <laughs> I've got over a thousand pages here on my desk. Um, Paulette did all the, the hard labor there of getting the contracts ready. We'll be sending those out to certified staff this week. Um, it costs a lot of money, obviously, not only to print those, but also to mail. And then we're also including a self-addressed and post, posted um, or post, posted um letter or envelope for folks to send those back. So there's a lot of money that goes with printing them out, sending them out, and then also providing postage for people to return those. Um, if we're able to get the HR records, everything will be done digitally. This would be the last time we ever have paper contracts. Some of those other um, requests for me today were, can you send me a copy of my old contract? I don't have it. So everything like that would be able to be viewed online. So again, it's the applicant tracking platform and the records platform. The cost right now is 26100 moving forward in future years. Um, it is 18000 There's that extra amount for that implementation. So I'm asking the board to um, move forward and I'll, I'll take any questions that you may have. I did present that information last time. Any questions for Dr. Ryan? May I have a motion to approve the purchase of power schools as presented? So moved. Second. Uh, Miller Unteed. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed say no. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you so much. This is going to make us a lot more efficient and effective. So I, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Is Chuck here? I am. Hey. Okay, Chuck, we've got the summer buildings, the summer project list. I have before you the list of summer projects that we have put together uh, for the schools. And um, we have highlighted some of the projects. We've put an asterisk in front of some of the projects that are relevant to our master facility plan. Uh, for example, Franklin, we're going to, we would like to replace some furnaces. Uh, the high school, um, we would like to replace a lot of the asphalt. Uh, it's not asterisk beside all of them, but it, it does include all of them. The auditorium lot, the band lot, the Bobcat Boulevard, and the frontage road that goes to the west of the uh, stadiums. Uh, we are looking at steam pipe replacement at Miller Middle School. 
um, and also some doors at Woodbury, which are not ADA compliant. The total for all of these projects is $429,000. Um, back to the flat work, the asphalt work at the high school, this exceeds the threshold of $125,000. So this will have to go out to public bid. We are um, looking at getting that documentation prepared so that we can have it in front of the board by the next board meeting so that that can go out so that we can secure those bids. Questions for Chuck? This might be a question for Paulette, but we have this money? Yeah, yes, we set aside about 500,000 every year out of PEPL for summer projects. Thank you. And Paulette, maybe we don't need to, but for newer members, a short explanation of PEPL? Yeah, of course. So PEPL is physical plant and equipment levy. Um, we are able to um, assess a property tax to collect this revenue. And then we use our um, PEPL money for buildings and grounds projects. We now pay for our copier lease out of there, um, our building lease out of there. We shifted some instructional, some non-instructional software to PEPL. So we, we allocate the whole, it's about 1.2 million per year and we have that allocated out um, between buildings and grounds, uh, transportation, we use it also to purchase buses and vehicles. Other questions for either Chuck or Paulette about the summer project list? If not, uh, may I have a motion to approve the summer project list? And I guess that would be to direct the, to obtain quotes or bids for those projects. Is that right? So moved. Second. Niblock Miller, all those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose, say no. Motion carries 7 0. Next up, Chuck, we've got the uh, soil testing contract for the tennis complex. As everyone is well aware, uh, we are entering into the uh, racket complex. Uh, it's going to be starting very, very soon. And we have secured uh, through FEH a, some bids for soil testing. We have two bids. Um, one is uh, from Terracon and uh, the other one is MTP. Regardless, uh, there is a disparity between the two bids of uh, a couple of thousand dollars. And Terracon actually, their bid is slightly higher. However, I am recommending that we move toward working with Terracon uh, simply because they were the company that did all of the work for us for phase two. Uh, they are very familiar with our site. They did the coring analysis on the existing tennis courts. Uh, we had that accomplished a, a couple of months ago and they were the ones who, who looked at the coring samples to establish what the base was uh, beneath the existing site and I have a, a high comfort level working with this, with this company, uh, specifically because of their 
familiarity with the district and the site. So I am, I am recommending that we move toward working with Terracon on this project. Questions for Chuck about this one? I, I would say, I mean, in, in uh, reviewing that letter from FEH, it does help to explain the disparity in in their estimated cost. Right, and there there are a lot of things that that don't compare apples to apples. I hate to use that analogy, but there are some things that just don't compare but once uh kevin from feh put it together it's an hourly based type contract and once he put those together and put them side by side it made perfect sense to me may i have a motion to approve contract with Terracon for soil testing services for the racket complex as presented. So moved. I'll second it. Baltus McGinnis. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed say no. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, we've now arrived at B's favorite part of the board meeting, policies. So I can uh, go ahead and take the lead on this. Um, with the first readings, as, as you might recall, Dr. Ryan brought forward three policies at the last meeting, new policy on nepotism, another on fraternization, and another on resignations of certified personnel. And then uh, Director Kozak, our transportation director, brought forward six policies in relationship to transportation uh, some of which were new or amended, all of which align with the transportation handbook that he brought forward. And then there was one policy that board director Faltus had relative to um, a regulation on the United States flag procedures. And we simply made amendments to make sure that what we had in that regulation aligned with current federal law. So I would recommend that those policies uh, be approved and have the second reading waived. There have been no changes to those since they were presented to the board at the last meeting. Okay, or remind me, I know you just said it, but are, are these all new or any of these changes? I mean, uh, amendments. Yeah, the first three policies that Dr. Ryan brought forward were new policies. So that's 401, 3, 4042, and 4047? Correct. Okay. May I have a motion to adopt um, 401, 3, 4042, and 4047 and waive the second reading? So moved. Second. Niblock Miller. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Those are adopted 7 0. Yeah, so then we had three policies in transportation that we did not have that were new from ISB. Um, that would be 711.2 R1 student conduct on school transportation, 711.2 R2, use of recording devices, 711.7 um, on school bus safety instruction, and 711.9 district vehicle idling. So those would be new policies adopted 
we're adopting the IASB policy. We did not previously have those in our handbook. Okay. So may I have a motion to adopt 711 R2, 711 2 R1, 7113, 7117, 7119, and waive the second reading. So moved. Second. Niblock Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Those are adopted 7-0. And then strictly amended policies would be 7011.2 student conduct, 7011.3 extracurricular activity bus services. And 907. And, uh, 907 R1. Yep, correct. Okay. So may I have a motion to amend 711 2, 711 3, and 907R1 and waive the second reading. So moved. Second. Niblock Faltis. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries seven zero. As far as the initial reviews, um, the first policy 206.3 on secretary treasurer, we're recommending that be simply marked as reviewed. And then there are 11 other policies, all of which deal with the board. So they're out of the 200 series that were recommended as um, either changes or um, additions from IASB. So those are 211 on open meetings. We're recommending adopting IASB. 201.7 organization of the board we're recommending adopt IASB 201.8 vacancies. We're recommending adopt IASB's policy. 204.4 annual meeting. Uh, we've simply added a paragraph to our policy from IASB. Um, 204.5R organization of meeting procedures. We're recommending that we align ours to match IASB's 204.6 notice of board meetings. We want to adopt IASB's 204.9 agenda and order of regular business. Um, IASB actually rescinded theirs. So um, I need to follow up with them to see if they're planning to replace that or Actually, I think we can probably, we may be able just to keep ours, but I need to follow up with them on that. 204.7 quorum for meetings. We want to adopt IASB. 204.12 minutes of meetings. Um, we want to retain ours, but take the closed session segment of ours out because there'll be a separate policy speaking to closed sessions. 206.1, new board of directors, uh, member development training. Um, we would add some ISB language to ours. And then 401.1 R2, the code of professional conduct and ethics regulation. There are some pretty significant changes that ISB was recommending. So we're, we're uh, recommending adopting their policy. Um, this should, these policies and their adoptions or amendments should put us uh, in pretty good shape relative to the IESB um, policy primer recommended changes. Um, this will be the last, this should be the last swing with a lot of policies at one time since they are directly related to the board work. I thought we might as well knock them all out uh, versus stretching them out over the course of the next couple meetings. 
Are there any, any questions um, for Dr. Schutte about any of these policies? And those would all- I don't have any questions, but I would like to encourage all of the board members to read these policies carefully if they have not already done so. Uh, are, is everybody okay with marking uh, 2063 will become 2064? It looks like the secretary treasurer policy as reviewed. Yes. Okay, we'll mark that one as reviewed. The, the rest yeah. of them will come back. And, and I would just echo what, what B just said, which is read those policies because they're, they're important policies. Okay, Adam, anything in uh, communications? Oh, there's always something in communication. <laughs> Um, well, I did want to say, and, and I want to credit Lisa for, um, for, uh, kind of getting me onto this, doing this project. But, uh, last week I devoted a lot of time to creating a visual, um, representation of how to basically navigate our learning from home website. Um, I'm working on trying to figure out how to, how to get that in multiple languages. I'm working, uh, one of the primary purposes of that is to, uh, work with JBS to uh, maybe reach many of the parents we know work at JBS and you know whether it's because they're working a you know they're they're working a late shift or you know uh, so we know a good percentage of our folks don't have um, regular internet access at home so I hope the visual will maybe help and some people are just visual learners and they can navigate easier by seeing you know, a guide rather than reading directions. That's just how some people prefer to learn. So, um, and then also planning to hand uh, those out as I have previously with other sorts of uh, documents um, to a few of the businesses that remain open and, and are attended like grocery stores and things like that. Uh, just to, again, sort of make those things available, widely available, available to people, so. One major thing I'm working on, and I'm sorry I've got a train coming through now. So, do you, if there's, do you have any questions for me about that or anything else? Thanks, Adam. Uh, reminders: two meetings, committee meetings have been canceled. Uh, our next regular board meeting is Monday, May 4th, 2020. Uh, once again, we're assured that there will be no uh, policies for initial review. <laughs> <laughs> Committee reports. Looks like the Public Arts Committee met. I don't know. I don't remember who's on that. Bob is Bob is on it. Yes, I have I have no. So, the public arts committee uh, met. We looked at roles and responsibilities. The membership of the committee, both as it stands and future interests. Um, some uh, a little bit on um, auditorium project related costs and uh, target fundraising. Um, there is a police and fire building project that will be installed by the 1st of June. Uh, and what else is it? That's, that's all I have. Thanks, Bob. Um, what have we done for kids tonight? I mean, we approved the 
kindergarten through sixth grade social studies curriculum or materials and the seventh through 12th grade English language arts materials, which is a lot of money and, and a pretty good deal. What else? We looked at handbooks. We looked, we looked at all the handbooks and approved the MLA handbook. Got a good update on what everybody's doing to help our kids learn while they can't go to school. Yeah. We've increased our um, amount of seat time for kids um, with the new school start and end times. Yep. Bea, do you have a quote for us for tonight? Oh, I do. I hope I can get it out while it's my computer or internet or something is still working. It comes from Helen Keller. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Did you hear it? Yeah. Good. Sure, it's the end of the meeting and now everything's working. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Niblock McGuinness. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. I'm we opposed. Are, we are I'm adjourned. Opposed. Oh, 6 to 1. We are adjourned. <laughs>